Okay. Anyway, hopefully you guys saw the announcement that your professor made. The extra credit exam is already posted. I already took a quick peek at it, and I feel like it's very similar to what you might actually encounter on Friday. Okay. So please give it your best try. Like, you have four attempts. So the first time that you take it, just take it without notes in two hours. Sorry, in one hour. Okay. Just see where you're at. Okay. So I was going to give you a little baseline on how you might do on the exam. Yes. That's something I cannot answer for sure. Your professor, it can vary. Usually he tries to decide after he gets the um, grades from the first exam. So if the average is really low, probably it's just based on um, completion. But if you guys are doing pretty good, then maybe accuracy. So yeah, I would just try to ask him and see what he says. Okay, so as you saw, he also mentioned what contents are gonna be on the exam. Most of it is gonna be on chapter nine, everything that we covered in the handout. And then for chapter 11, keep in mind this handout is already posted. Does everyone have access to it? Okay, we're all good, we know where they are. Yes, it should be in your Canvas course. So for Orgo 2, just go to files and look for the folder that says SI Spring 24, all in caps. And there you can find every single handout. But for chapter 11, at least for the first exam, you only have to worry basically just about alcohols. Okay, that's going to be the major topic. So naming alcohol, different properties that they have, acidity, um, your addition reactions, which hopefully you guys remember. Those are the ones that we were talking about before. But usually chapter 11 and 12, they tend to be combined. So probably when you go to lecture, especially after your exam, you're going to see that a lot of the concepts are just going to be mixed and matched. That's why the handout is for both chapter 11 and 12. Okay. But to simplify it, I like to use my dog and my cat as a reference. Okay. So if you see my dog next to it, that means that it's going to be on the first exam. But if you see my cat next to it, like in the ethers portion, that's for the second exam, so do not worry about it right now. Okay, just look at my dog, focus on her. Don't look at my cat. She's for the next exam, okay? I'm going to be posting this exact thing so you guys can keep track of what's going to be in the first one, what's going to be in the second one, so don't worry about it. You're going to have access to it. But hopefully today we're going to be able to finish everything that you should need for the first exam, so let's just get started with it. And let me check, okay. There's one person online, but if you have any questions, just let me know on the chat because for some reason, the audio is not working. Okay, so alcohols, how to name them. Hopefully you guys remember that from Orgo 1. That was back in chapter two, I guess. Yeah. Okay, what's the ending that we have to use for alcohols? Oh, well, exactly. Okay, now let's look at our very first molecule. No carbon chain in here. Okay. You find the name of a molecule. What am I looking for? What are the steps? Longest chain. Okay. Does it have to include the alcohol group or not? So that means that that carbon chain could be my parent chain. Okay. So in that case, what kind of substituents do you have? Do you just have carbon chains and an alcohol group? What takes the highest priority? Alcohol, okay. So just for reference, whatever takes the highest priority, that should be included in your pairing chain. Why? Because we usually um, use the um, suffix for the ones that have the higher priority. So in this case, for example, I need to include this portion in the pairing chain. So to do that, I'm just gonna look at this portion and then should it go to the left or to the right? left because again, remember, we need the longest continuous carbon chain. Okay, so remember, again, the ones with highest priority, you want the lowest token possible. So this is gonna be your number one. You have two, three, four, and five. A five carbon chain, how do we call it? Pentane, but because we have an alcohol group, pentanol. Okay. Remember, IUPAC is very specific. So wherever you have any substituents, you have to be um, <clears throat> more precise on where you found them. But in this case, the alcohol is in carbon one. So do I need to include one before pentanol? No, 
Remember, whenever you have something in carbon one, it's not always necessary for you to include it, okay? It's just implicit. But if it's in any other carbons, you have to include it, okay? So we have pentanol. Is that the full name? What am I missing? Mm -hmm. That little carbon chain is branching off. It's a two carbon chain, so how do we call that? It's more specifically an ethyl group, because remember, they have to end in YL whenever they are substituent. Okay, so questions on it. It should be two. Thank you for that. Yes, remember IUPAC okay. is very specific. Okay, any other questions so far? Do we remember that? Pretty easy. Okay, we're comfortable. Okay, now let's look at the little guy on the right, the one with the benzene group. How would you start? So that means this is going to be my position one. And then what's my carbon chain? What's the parent chain? Do you all agree? Mm-hmm. You're absolutely correct. That carbon right in the middle, that's going to be your parent chain, okay? That's the one that's connected to the different substituents that you have. One of them, the one with the highest priority is your alcohol group, okay? Now then, we have a benzene that's directly connected to the parent chain. So how do we call a substituent like that? We have two different terms, phenol and benzyl. What was the difference between the two of them? Benzyl has the bend. This one, it's a phenol group. Okay, so we have the phenol. We know that's the alcohol. So what's going to be the full IUPAC name for this guy? We know what we have. We just have to put it together. So what's the name? Best guess. You're absolutely correct. This guy is just your phenol, methanol. And in this case, I don't need to include any numbers because everything is connected to the only carbon in the parent chain, yes. So yes, hypothetically, let's say that we had a very similar molecule. So let me draw it in here. But you had a carbon in between before you touch the parent chain. Whenever there's a little bent in between the benzene and the parent chain, that's a benzyl group. So let me just <clears throat> do this in this case. Let me redo this. Okay. If it's directly connected to the parent chain, this guy is phenol. But benzyl is going to be whenever your parent chain is here and there's a carbon in between your benzene. That's a really crappy benzene, but illustrates the point. Okay. Phenol directly connected to it. Benzyl, little bent in between. Okay. So far, questions on that. Do we remember those terms? Okay. Please remember those terms because we're going to be using them later on for the ethers portion. Okay. But so far, that's it as far as IUPAC for alcohol groups. So any questions on that? We're good. Very familiar. Very comfortable. Okay. Are we ready to continue with a handout? Okay. Let's see. Now, next thing is going to be your physical properties, which hopefully you guys still remember. I know that it was very early on in the semester back in Org 1, but... Some of the things that you were talking about was probably melting point and boiling point, okay? So in this case, I already gave you the little refresher on the trends. So I don't think that's included in the handout, so just start writing those down in here. Now, for this class, we're only going to be talking about boiling point, not melting point. So it's, it should be relatively easy, so you shouldn't confuse the trends. But remember, 
the higher the boiling point is going to be whenever your molecule has stronger intermolecular forces. So hydrogen bonds, dipole-dipole moments, and then your London dispersion forces. Then next aspect is going to be branching and the molecular weight. The less branching you have, the higher the boiling point. Okay, But as far as molecular weight, the heavier it is, the, <clears throat> the higher the boiling point. Okay, so just by refreshing those rules, let's look at the very first example in here. We have a little alcohol group versus an ether. Which one is going to have a higher boiling point? Why? Exactly. It's going to be the alcohol group because this one has hydrogen bonding, which is a stronger intermolecular force than the one in ether. The ether, what kind of forces are there? What are the forces in the ether? What's the name? It's dipole dipole. So as you can see, hydrogen bonding, it's stronger than dipole dipole. And what's the force that's included in both of them? London dispersion forces, yes. Okay, so far, questions on that? We're good. Pretty simple trend. Okay, now, what about the next ones? This time we just have ether, so we can look at the intermolecular forces. So that means you're looking at what exactly? They both have the same branching. They're both. Mm -hmm. Remember that branching is basically whenever it looks like you have <clears throat> a little tree. There's things just taken out of the same carbon. But in this case, everything is just linear in there. So there's no branching technically. But yes, the main difference was on the molecular weight. So that means that the one on the left side is going to have a higher boiling point because it has a higher molecular weight. OK? Questions so far on that? Less branching, higher boiling point. But in this case, we weren't looking at branching. OK. So far, we're good. It makes sense so far. OK, now let's look at the one with four molecules. This time, I want you to rank them. So just take a quick look at them. Which of those molecules is going to be the one with the highest boiling point? A, B, C, or D? Why A? What do you notice? So yes, remember, first thing that you're always going to look at is just the intermolecular forces. You're going to look at each of those aspects individually. Do not try to combine them all at once because sometimes you might get confused or a little overwhelmed with all of the rules. Okay, so go step by step. So in that case, <clears throat> we know that hydrogen bonds, are stronger intermolecular forces, higher boiling point. In this case, we have two portions that show hydrogen bonding. So, of course, it's going to be the one with the highest boiling point. Yes. But in this case, uh, I don't think your professor is going to go. I don't think your professor is going to show you that many examples um, focused on symmetry. Usually, the examples that you might see on the exam are like the first one. They're pretty straightforward. So, yeah. Okay, so A is the one with the highest boiling point. What's going to be the second one? Okay, so two different answers. C or B? Okay, raise your hand if you think it's B. Okay, put them down. Raise your hand if you think it's C. Okay, so for those of you who chose B, why did you chose B instead of C? What did you notice? Less branching. So in this case, first of all, they both have the same exact intermolecular force. So you're looking at the next aspect, which is branching. B has less branching. Everything is more linear. But on C, we see a little carbon here that has different connections. Okay? So because of that, there's more branching there. So... That one's the third one. And then last one should be pretty obvious. It's the one that doesn't have any hydrogen bonding. 
So it's right here. Okay. So for questions on that, yes. We have less branching. Branching is basically whenever from a carbon, a lot of things are sticking out of it. In this case, everything is the same. Way. But in this case, we have a carbon that has multiple connections to other carbons or other atoms. Okay. So far, any other questions? Oh, and just in case you haven't noticed, the answer key for the previous chapter, chapter nine, it's already posted. Okay, so you can take a look at that. It's just in the folder um, answers. It's gonna be in the same um, file, basically. But yeah, now, Let's start to get into acidity. That's the next property of alcohol that we have to discuss. So in this case, sometimes you might get one conceptual question on how your alcohols are going to be acting. Now, there's going to be a specific answer for this, which I'm going to give it to you. But I want you to notice that alcohol groups are going to be somewhat similar to water. Okay. Now, technically they can both be acids or bases, okay? Remember that it always depends on what you have around the molecule, okay? So, <clears throat> but in this case, just for simplicity, your alcohol groups, we're gonna consider them weak bronsted acids, okay? And just in case, if you wanna review your definitions of bronsted, Lewis, acids, and bases, I did a little chart at the bottom for you guys. So, <clears throat> questions on that so far? Are we good? Okay. Now, do we need a few more minutes to finish writing down our notes? Okay, yes. I'll give you guys a few more minutes, and then we're going to talk about are you. Okay, while well, you guys are still writing down your notes, let's just start talking about um acidity in general, okay? So for acidity, hopefully you guys remember cardio or are you? Whatever you learned in Norgo 1, they're, they are the same thing, okay? I'm just going to be focusing on are you? I don't really like to look at the charge because you're not going to get that many problems with charges in Norgo 2, so. But pKa was very related to acidity. So what was the trend with pKa and acidity? How do you know you have a strong acid based on the pKa? The lower the pKa. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So remember that trend. Now, if you have a strong acid, after you do your reaction, that means that you're creating a conjugate base, right? Okay. Is it going to be a strong conjugate base or a weak? conjugate base, weak. Remember that that relationship is always inversely proportional. So if you start with a weak acid, you create a strong conjugate base, okay? So let's move on to this portion. Okay, so here at the bottom first, there's a little <clears throat> review of ARIA and PK trends that you should definitely look at. I also gave you the acidity trend for the periodic table. Um, but yeah, you can start writing that down, take a photo if you want. If we finish this today, the file is going to be available for you guys later today. So either way. Now, <clears throat> in this case, remember, if we start with a little alcohol group in here, after an acid-base reaction, I technically just deprotonate. So I have an acid and I have my conjugate base. Now, do any of you know the name of a regular conjugate base? What's the term that we use? I'm not sure if your professor already mentioned that in lecture.
this guy, whenever we have conjugate bases for, that come from alcohol, we're just going to call them an alkoxide, okay? This portion, the first portion, the alkyl part, alkyl carbon chain, that's going to be more specific to how many carbons you have per, um, <clears throat> per molecule. So this is just like the general term, like carbonyl groups, okay? Carbonyl groups are just generalizing functional groups with a carbon double bonded to an oxygen, okay? Okay, now, let's start easy. With the first molecule that you see there, right in the middle, we just have a pure carbon chain, but there are three different arrows, and I want you to rank them. Which one is going to be the most acidic and why? I'm hearing C. Why C? Mm -hmm. Because remember, in RU, the last thing that you have to look at is orbital. And the trend is SP, so triple bonds. Then SP2, your double bonds. And last one, single bonds, SP3. So by knowing that, we know that C is going to be the most acidic. Then it's going to be my double bond. And then I just have my pure single bonds. Okay. For C, it's SP. For B, it's SP2. And for A, it's SP3. More to less acidic. Okay, now let's start looking at four different molecules in there. So just based on your own knowledge of ARIA, because we still haven't reviewed ARIA again, which of those molecules do you think is going to be the most acidic? B as a boy? B as a dog? Two different answers. What do we think on the left side? Okay, so let's go back to Aria. So remember that Aria is giving you a specific order, okay? First thing you're going to look at is going to be your atom. Then if you have the same exact atom, that's when you start moving on further down. So then resonance, inductive effects, and then orbital. But let's just do a quick refresher on Aria. Atom, how do we know that I have an acidic molecule based on the atom? The more electronegative one. Okay, then what about resonance? The more or the less resonance, the more acidic it is. The more resonance, the more acidic you are because it can stabilize the alkoxide portion, let's say. What about inductive effects? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's pretty similar to the atom portion because we're going to have something that's very de-shielding. We can use that term now. But um, yeah, the closer the inductive effects you have to the deprotonated part of the molecule, the more acidic it is, okay? And then orbital, that's the one that we just reviewed. So triple bonds are more acidic than double bonds, then single bonds. Okay, so let's go back here. So first thing that you have to notice is the atom portion, okay? I'm just looking at the atom. So A has an alcohol group as well as B and D. C is just a carbon chain. So just by looking at that, I can already tell that C is gonna be the last one, okay? It doesn't have any electronegative atoms. So I'm between three answer choices, okay? Now, they all have the same exact atoms. So now I move on to the R, resonance. Now, which one do you think is gonna have more resonance? B, D, okay. It's not only about resonance, it's also about the best um, resonance forms that you could create. Just remember, it's all about the stability of the deprotonated versions. So once the hydrogens leave, you're left with your negative charge, right? That's the part that we're trying to balance out, that we're trying to stabilize. If we start looking at B, this guy, we have a benzene group adjacent to it. So of course, there's going to be a lot of resonance happening there. But that means that the negative charge is going to be moving around just carbons, right? Usually with charges, we always prefer to have them in electronegative atoms, okay? They're the best ones to hold any sort of charges. Now, 
theme, we also have resonance in there because of the corneal area. But you can probably notice the negative charge is going to end up in an, another electronegative atom. So that's going to make it a way better form than the ones that we can get from B. Okay. So that means that D is actually going to be more acidic than B. So always think about all of the aspects of resonance. It's not just <clears throat> the many different forms that you could get. It's all about stabilizing, which one gives you the better form. Okay. And then, of course, the last one is just going to be three. Yes. Because for acidity, remember, if they're acids at the end, they're just going to get deperinated. That's the role of acids, to give up a hydrogen. So once they go away, you're left with the alkoxide. So you always should be um, thinking about how to stabilize that guy. The more stable it is, the less reactive it is. So that's the whole goal with this. <clears throat> mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So far, questions on the ranking of those four molecules. We're good. Does it make sense? Okay. Now, let's make it a little bit harder. Let's look at the next problem. This time you have five molecules. So <clears throat> just by looking at that, which one could we make, um, which one could we say that it's the most acidic? Why did we say E? What did we notice? The electronegative atom. That's the only one that has this guy in there. Now, could we already mark the least acidic molecule? Beautiful. That's just a pure carbon chain. Okay, so now you only have to rank three molecules. So, I'm going to give you one to two minutes to try and solve this on your own. You guys can talk to each other. You can look at your notes to try to figure it out on your own. You only have to rank three molecules at this point. Okay, it's been about two minutes right now. So did we find the ranking of the remaining molecules? Okay, what's gonna be the second most acidic? Why C? So <clears throat> while you guys were working on this, I started drawing out the acidic hydrogens, okay? So automatically, as soon as you're asked to rank any molecules, just deperinate every single acid that you see in there because it's all about stabilizing the negative charge that comes after those guys leave. So negative charge is here. 
here and here. So yes, yeah, so as you can probably see on C, my negative charge is going to be in between two carbonyl groups. That gives me extra resonance. And then also the benzene group. So yeah, what's going to be the third most acidic? D, exactly. It has two carbonyls that can stabilize it as compared to B that only has one. Okay, so far, questions on that? Are you good? It makes sense? Okay, so we solved all those problems just by knowing the concepts behind ARIA, okay? So sometimes you're not going to be provided with a PK, but you should be able to figure it out just based on ARIA. Okay, are we ready for the next and last concepts that you guys should know for the first exam? Okay, oh, question. So yeah, two versus three. Let me bring the pointer in here. Okay, so two versus three. Remember that I drew out the acidic hydrogens. After they go away, you're left with a negative charge, which is the one drawn in purple, right? Now, the goal is to stabilize that charge as we saw before in the previous example. It was all about which one can create the most stable resonance forms. C has an extra room to do resonance because of the phenyl group here at the bottom as compared to D, that it only has two carbonyl groups. It doesn't have the extra room of the benzene, okay? So it's just literally because of the benzene. <clears throat> okay, any other questions so far? Uh, I have a question. I don't okay. know if you can hear me. Uh, there's someone Hello? with a question. Can you please write it on the chat? Okay. Because right now, if you were talking, we can't hear you. Dang. Or maybe there was no question. Just type it on the chat. <laughs> what the difference? of the benzyl group from this question and the last question. So, great question. So before, remember that we were looking at different molecules that, first of all, they both just started with an alcohol group. The ones at the bottom, we never started with any alcohol groups on either of those. So automatically, we're not even looking at the same factor in ARIA. We're not looking at the atom. We're just focusing on the resonance. <clears throat> now, in this case, in the previous example, we saw that in molecule D, the negative charge is gonna be bouncing around electronegative atoms, which makes it really stable. You want charges to be always in something that's very electronegative. But on B, we only have one atom that can hold that charge really well. And then we just have fewer carbons to bounce around. Now, going back to the last problem we just did, <clears throat> after we do our <clears throat> deprotonation, we're left with a negative charge. Now, we don't have any electronegative atoms adjacent to it. So they have the same exact amount, okay? So they look like pretty much the same exact molecule, but the only difference again, it's the benzene group. This benzene group is creating extra stability. But remember, as far as electronegative atoms go, it didn't have the same thing that we saw before, okay? I'm not sure if that really answered your question, but let me know. Do you guys have questions on that too? A in here or A on the previous problem? Okay, so you were saying why A is ranked lowest because it doesn't have any heteroatoms at all. It doesn't show any potential for really um, strong forms of resonance forms, okay? Mm -hmm. So pretty much, if you just see a pure carbon chain, that's usually gonna be always the weakest acid, okay? But if you have something that's somewhat electronegative, oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, things like that, that could tell you that, oh, I might do resonance or I might have more inductive effects. Okay, so you're gonna have more acidic factors. 
Okay, I'm glad that I answered your question. So do we have any other questions online? We're good? No more questions here in person. We're good? Okay, let's continue. Okay, so this portion is what we were talking about in the previous SI session. I told you guys that you should remember three different reactions in here. Right now, the names are not given, but I, I kind of hope that you guys remember them just by looking at the reagents, okay? So let's just start with the very first one. So all of them are addition reactions, meaning that we're gonna start from a double bond and go to a single bond, okay? Now, if we start with H2O and H3O+, plus, what kind of reaction is that? It's your acid catalyzed hydration. Exactly. So let's just start writing that here. Acid catalyzed hydration. Okay. What about the second one? What do you see on the arrow? That's oxymercuration, demercuration. And then very last one, hydroboration oxidation. Okay. Now, in Orgo 1, you guys already learned the exact full mechanism, transition states, intermediates, all of that. Now, in this case, the only thing that I want you to keep in mind is just how the product is going to look like. And to know that, you need to know the rules of each of those reactions. Okay, so before we even look at the product, let's talk about regioselectivity and stereoselectivity. Okay. So for your acid catalyzed hydration, did it have any regioselectivity? More carbon cups. Okay. What does that mean? It goes on the less substituted side because you create a more stable alcohol group. Okay, so in this case, let's just write here, OH goes to more substituted side. <clears throat> now, did it have any stereoselectivity? No. Okay, let's do the same for oxymercuration, demercuration. What's the regioselectivity? Markovnikovs as well. That one's still Markovnikov, so the OH still goes to the more substituted side. What about stereoselectivity? Do we have any? No. And then very last one, your hydroboration oxidation, regioselectivity. Anti-Markovnikovs. So remember, that's anti, so it's the complete opposite. This time the OH goes to the least substituted side. Goes to less substituted side. In this case, I'm focusing on the OH group. But if you're looking at hydrogens, the trend is the opposite. So if it's Markovnikovs, we know that the OH goes to the more substituted side. So the hydrogen goes to the less substituted side. But if we're looking at anti-Markovnikovs, I gave you the trend for oxygen, sorry, for alcohol first. Alcohol goes to the less substituted side, meaning that the hydrogen goes to the more substituted side. And the more and less substituted side is just referring to the double bond, okay? The more substitutions that you have in the double bond. But hydroboration, does it have any stereoselectivity? What is it? What's into each other? The things that you added. So that means that one of the hydrogens and the alcohol group need to be in the same plane of symmetry. Sorry, in the same plane. Okay, so both have to be wedges or both have to be dashes. Let's just write in addition. Okay, now, next important rule is all about rearrangement. So that has to do with your intermediate. So again, let's start with your acid catalyzed hydration. What kind of intermediate do you have? How does it look like? Carbocation. Remember, whenever you see a carbocation, if possible, you're always going to do rearrangements. So, yes, because of the carbocation. Now, oxymercuration, demercuration. So I'm not going to ask you to give me the name, 
of the intermediate. Okay, you don't have to know it, but it's the one that basically looks like a little triangle. Okay, so in that intermediate, we didn't have a full carbocation. We had partial charges. So partial charges, we're not gonna be able to do any rearrangements with them. So keep that in mind. The only one that can change the carbon skeleton is gonna be your acid catalyzed hydration. Okay, and same thing goes for your hydroboration. That's the one with the square looking um, transition state. But again, we don't have any full positive charges, so no rearrangements, yes. That's halogenation as well, yeah. It's both, yeah. Yeah, and again, you're not gonna have questions on how the transition state or an intermediate look like. I just wanted to <clears throat> notice why we're not doing rearrangements or why we are doing them, okay? So let's just start looking at the different reactions and the products that we might have, okay? So pretty much, let's start with the simple ones and those are gonna be the ones that don't do any rearrangements, okay? Because what does that mean? That means that the carbon skeleton you, like, you start with, it's staying the exact same. So I can just start drawing the same exact molecule here, but without the double bond. I know that's going to be the only main difference. Now, remember, I'm just going to look at both carbons in your double bond. If we're starting with oxymercuration, demercuration, we know that we have to do Markovnikov's. We need to follow Markovnikov's rule. So am I going to choose carbon one or carbon two to add the alcohol group. Carbon two. So that means that my alcohol group is here and then my hydrogen is going to carbon one. Now, same process here for hydroboration oxidation. I have carbon one and carbon two, but now the rule is different. So where am I gonna add my alcohol group? On one. So notice how by just knowing the rules, you can pretty much just guess accurately what's gonna be the product, okay? So you don't need to do any full mechanisms to get to the products, okay? So, so far, questions on those two reactions. Okay, now let's do the one that we have to be a little more careful with, which is your acid catalyzed hydration. Now, same process, let's just look at carbon one and carbon two of the double one. If it's Markovnikov's at the end, where do I want to attach my alcohol group? One, it's going to be to two. Remember, Markovnikov's OH goes to more substituted side. Now, before you even draw that out, in this case, this is going to be the only one in where I'm going to encourage you to draw out the intermediate, so the carbocation. If I know that it's Markovnikov's and in carbon two, I'm going to add the OH group, that means that the original carbocation is gonna be there. And then yes, carbon one is gonna have the hydrogen. Now, carbocations, before you finalize your reaction, you have to see if you have the most stable version of it. So in this case, what kind of carbocation do we have? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Tertiary, so is that the most stable one? Yes, it is. Okay, there's a little insect in here, but either way. If it's tertiary, then we're going to keep it as it is. But what if it was primary or secondary? Rearrangements. Okay. So in this case, I'm just going to keep the same exact carbon skeleton. But again, I want you to be careful with that specific reaction. Okay. That's going to be the only one in where you're going to draw out the intermediate. Okay. So. <clears throat> okay. Questions on that? We do have a question online. Okay. So more substituted is more stable. As far as the carbocation goes, yes. The more substituted you are, the more stable it is. So the trend usually it's the allylic position, then tertiary, then secondary, and then primary, as far as stability for carbocations. Okay. Any other questions so far in those reactions? Do we think they're simple, a little hard? How do we feel about those? Um, you have a question. What does the numbers in pink represent? That's just to look at the substitution of each of the carbons in here. So remember, I'm just doing this so you guys can follow Markovnikov's or anti-Markovnikov's. So 
I just like to point out those two carbons that we have and just label them. So you can tell me which one is <clears throat> gonna follow the correct addition. So if we're following Markovnikov's rule, that tells me that the OH have to be on the more substituted side. Therefore, it would be in carbon two. But if I was in a reaction in where I had anti-Markovnikov's, that means that I would add it in position one. So this is just me trying to give you a little visual aid before I give you the answer, basically. But that's pretty much all you have to know for chapter 11 for the first exam. I'm not sure if your professor is gonna continue to this portion. So I'm not gonna go through it yet. If I see that today in lecture, he does cover that, don't worry, we're gonna look at it on Monday, okay? Otherwise, if he doesn't go through that, we're just gonna be um, reviewing for your exam. Okay, so get ready for that. We're gonna do a few practice problems in SI. Okay, and if you have any questions, again, just let me know. If you have specific practice problems, just email it to me so maybe we can do it in SI. Okay, so that's it, guys. Have a great rest of your weekend and go to lecture. Sorry? <laughs> no problem okay take care guys